first up, we have Mike Richter here, who is president of Breakcore Energy, but prior to that, he had a whole different life. So, Mike, why don't you tell us a little bit about what you were doing from Thank 1989 you, to 2003? Uh, well, I had an athletic career with the New York Rangers. I was a goaltender um, if in the NHL for 14 years. Um, like most kids, Nicole, I know you're from Michigan, played sports as a kid and wanted to play at a higher level and was able to go to uh, Wisconsin, the Olympic team, and then the pros. And you know, a bit about what we'll talk today is, is my second career and um, it was a little overlap from my first to my second, but I think the kind of crux is that you get done an athletic career and you have your whole life to live. And so what do you do with that? Um, you feel ancient. I was 38 when I retired. I got injured and you know, tried to play, and you're going to come to an end one way or another, right? And um, you either age out uh, one way or another. They don't offer you a contract. And, but you know, you have 18-year-old kids coming in to supplant you. And it's, it's, so you feel like you're, you know, you're retiring from life, and that is the life you knew. And so I always felt like at 25, I was probably more able to retire than I would have been at 35 because you become that person, your, your ego, your, your everything you know as an adult is wrapped around that thing. Um, I left school two years early um, to play on the Olympic team and then sign a pro contract. And a window opens up. You either take it or you don't. So the timing is what it is. And um, I always said to myself, just to complete you know, what I started, I would go back to school. And that was kind of the segue into my next life. So Mike is very humble. He's also a U.S. Ho Hockey Hall of Famer, uh, multi-time, I mean, many awards, been on the Olympic team. So yeah, he's, we have kind of a star here, just so you know. Um, so you're, you're 38. Yeah. You've had this whole career. You're, you're young in human terms, but exactly. in career terms, yeah. you know, you're, you're, you're no spring chicken, right? So, so what, where do you go from there? Well, um, you're exactly right. As I said, you, you feel old, but school going back, I went uh, two years. I had a young family at the time, so I'm in a very, very different place. It was, you know, as I look back, great timing. I had three young boys, um, well, two and one on the way. And so it was time to think outside your own, you know, your own self. And um, I was able to go back to school. I went to Yale on the East Coast. Uh, I wanted to go back to Wisconsin, and my advisors like, Mike, your mom's there, she's old, you're, you know, got young kids. That's where you've been as an adult, stay there. And it was great. I had, as an athlete, really, at least in my experience, what do you do? You, you work out, you prepare for the next event, um, the next season, the next game, the next shot in terms of goaltender. And you're really, you're, 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 your focus is very much right ahead. You have your strategy, but you, you wake up one day and it's 15 years later. And so I had always in the back of my mind said, I'll go back to school and I want to have a career. And I was always interested in, in the environment and particularly just all the resource constraints that we have. You can see it in water, you can see it in the food um, and certainly in energy and that intersection where finance is because it seems to me like a, maybe ethically the right thing to do is start to be smart about this, but also just uh, as an opportunity. It's a, it's a business opportunity if you can find ways of being more efficient with these resources. There's more people, there's more demand. Um, yeah, that, that would be the place to go. So that's one thing I love about that pivot is playing a sport was great. It's a personal challenge. It's wonderful. But, you know, the world's not better for stopping a hockey puck. And then you can start to do things that matter a little bit more on, on the outside world. Um, you have a great platform for doing it. And hockey's, you know, a, a small sport compared to football or baseball or basketball in this, in this um, uh, nation. But you were able to get in and open some doors. So I was really happy. I had done a lot of just research on my own, if you will. I, I, I would read a lot of not for profit, or sorry, you know, nonfiction books and got into non for profits when I retired just to start to get my feet wet in the real world, if, if you can call it that, because you have lived in a very artificial environment in a way. And so I wanted to just learn about what the issues are and where I can make a difference. Um, and, and you know, this isn't all altruistic. I'm, I'm trying to start a business. And so that's really where I've been since I graduated at uh, 40 years old. Um, just I've been in the, you know, project finance space um, and absolutely love it. 
Uh, so Mike also spoke at our Health Spaces event last night, and I remember you um, telling a story about <clears throat> people asking you why an athlete would care about these issues, and I loved your answer, so I'm going to make you answer it again. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'll see if I can reproduce it. I made it up yesterday. So. Um, it was interesting. I, I, I got on to, uh, out of New York, uh, there was a group called the uh, Waterkeeper, Riverkeeper, and they're just trying to clean up the bays and the rivers around the tri-state area. And someone said on the board, they said, you're, you're some surprising environmentalist. And I'm like, you know, what, what does that even mean? I don't know what an environmentalist, A, looks like, and B, why surprising? Because in my experience as an athlete, you know, most of them that I've met that are at any kind of um, competitive level are pretty anal about how they prepare and they understand, and I think this is key and, and maybe key for the people in this room, the connection is health. If you're gonna perform to your maximum, you're gonna have a hard time doing that if you, if you don't have your health. Uh, you look at the Olympics that we just had, you can wait four years, you're not waiting, you're, you're preparing for it, and if that in two weeks you have a flu or you have a bad ankle, your career, your life can take a different trajectory. Um, so if you don't have your health, you don't have your performance. And that's, in a way, the basis of, of my company and what we're doing with buildings is just trying to make them perform better and trying, it's, it's not about owls and fishes, it's about people and having these places healthier and better um, environments in which to go to school and to sleep if it's a hotel and, and to have these conferences. Um, if it's a home, the same thing. Uh, I think next door we have um, Matt from Well speaking, and it's very much along those lines. The air exchange, the fresh air, the amount of sunlight, the color temperature of the lights, these things matter to humans. And so the idea of a, a surprising environmentalist made no sense to me because I think there's a direct connection I had a coach that once said, you know, you have a Ferrari. Your body is your vehicle to get to where you need to be. That, as an athlete, is everything. And why would you fuel that thing with Doritos or crappy food? I mean, I, I eat everything, but I mean, I understand what he was saying. Why put muddy, crappy gasoline in a high-performance vehicle and expect it to perform in, in, in any kind of uh, meaningful way? And I think that's something that you, you, know, you want to think about when you're talking about your buildings and your hotels and where we live. You spend so much time in the built environment. Are these things good for people or are they just cheap things that we happen to keep out of the rain? There was a great quote by uh, Phil Knight once and someone said, you know, why are you marketing the sneakers in this way? He said, if you, I think if, if you have a body, you're an athlete. And I would say, you know, we, we talked about this after the thing, it's, this is not a political statement. It doesn't matter whether you're liberal or conservative or Republican or whatever. Um, who doesn't want fresh air, clean, uh, clean water, um, healthy environments for the kids, for themselves to live? So, you know, how you go about it, we can squabble. But it's a, it's a legitimate goal for everybody. So to, to add to Phil Knight's quote, you know, if you have a body, you're an athlete, I'd say if you have a body, you're an environmentalist. You don't want to be sucking in bad air, you don't want to be in an environment, whether it's a built environment or outside, that's, that's not healthy. So I think that's part of what we're doing with this. But in the end, we're very much focused on energy systems and primarily upgrading existing systems. You know, there's a stat, um, our, our offices are outside of New York City and something like 80% of the building stock in New York is gonna be there in the next three decades. You're not gonna take down the Empire State Building and suddenly put up a lead platinum building. You're gonna retrofit that thing one way or another. Maybe a little bit, maybe a lot, uh, or maybe not at all, but that building's probably going to stay. And it's the guts of those buildings that we need to improve upon. And there's, you know, the kind of thesis is there's off-the-shelf technologies right now. I don't have to invent something. I don't need Elon Musk to come up with something crazy. There's better LED lights. There's solar where it applies. There's battery storage. The cost curve's coming down. We're getting to the point now where we can really upgrade these buildings, the infrastructure of these buildings, kind of behind the scenes. and. Um, make it healthier, make it perform better. And what we sell is, yeah, health, but we're not a well group. We're selling savings, financial savings. So if you know, I can take a million dollars worth of lights out of this, the infrastructure here and put in something that requires 50% of the demand, you're saving 50% with the same burn hours. It's pretty straightforward, you know. Some might use the word sustainability to describe <laughs> yeah. uh, the, the work that you do, but uh, you have some interesting thoughts on that. So how do you define sustainability? Right. We were talking about this yesterday. I mean, if I asked everybody in this room, you'd have, we all know what we're talking about, but it's slightly different definitions. So we talk green, we talk environmental, we talk sustainability, but nobody really knows what the heck that is. Um, is it truly carbon neutral? Is it just healthy? And I think 
what we have to move from, and this frustrates me a little bit because I don't think we as a company do a particularly good job at this. The people in the environmental industry, whatever the heck that is, don't either. We should just replace that word with the word better. If you look at Elon Musk, he's a lot of things, but that car is getting traction not because the tailpipe emissions are zero. It's not because um, he's just a good marketer. That car performs well. And in the past, when you think of conservation and environmentalism, it would be put on a sweater, turn down the thermostat, and say, you know, I'm gonna freeze my backside off, but this is better because I'm using less oil in my house. But you're uncomfortable. It's not a good work environment. It's not a good living environment. If you look at the houses nowadays and the building materials, I mean, you guys know this more than me, it's unbelievable what you can do. I had a really interesting um, just experience. Um, I grew up in Philadelphia. I went to school my uh, senior year in Lake Placid, New York, and I got a little summer house there. And there was a guy on the, who's a, I became friends with, he's on the local Nature Conservancy board. He's kind of this, like a nutty professor. He's a biologist and he's always tinkering things. And he's building a house on this hillside. And the guys that were constructing this house had done some work at, 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 on my boathouse. And these were North, you know, New York guys, chewing tobacco, tough dudes, have a beer at the end of the day, don't tell them what to do. They've been in this space for two, three decades. They're great people, tough people, and they know what they're doing. And along comes this guy who knows everything and has uh, an architect, a green architect, and wants to build a building in a certain manner that they've never seen. And he wanted to make this building um, carbon negative, okay? It had solar panels, had geothermal. The, the damn walls were almost two feet thick. But from the outside, when this house was done, it looked like any other house. And these guys, I stopped over, and uh, Larry is the man's name, said, oh, you got to see the construction site. So I came over, and these guys like, this dude is a clown. He's speaking. He's, he's paying us almost twice as much. We've been here. I keep insulating this wall. We got blown in foam. We got the, you know, the hard panels on the outside. And you could see where the windows were. It was, it was like 18 inches. And it was like, what is he doing? And these guys were kind of ridiculing behind his back. And they're funny guys, but they're like, this is silliness. I came back maybe two months later. It was in December. Sleeting out, it's a crappy day. There's no heat in this place yet. These guys are in t-shirts. The windows now have been put in, the whole envelope's in there. And they're like, this place is unbelievable. Look at this. It's 35 degrees outside, and I'm sitting there in a t-shirt. There's no heat. You know, they have their machines, they have their body heat. And you can hear as you're walking to a place, it's quiet, it's dry, it's insulated, it's unbelievable. And I've been back since. And what's cool about this house is you don't know you're in this newfangled house. It just looks like a house. And you can get a little bit of sense from the depth of those um, windowsills. But otherwise, it's just a house that happens to perform unbelievably. There's no hot spots, no cold spots. I, I live in a house in early 1900s. You know, if I walk by my kitchen, my hair's blowing. Like, it's just, it's a sieve, it's, it's oil heat, it's a piece of crap. And I love the house, it's beautiful, but the performance is not very good. And you know, when an oil furnace goes on, you smell the oil in your house and all that, that's not particularly healthy. And to, to kind of juxtapose what I'm living in and what I love to this modern house. I mean, this is off the shelf technology. This guy didn't pull his stuff, you know, didn't create it himself. And that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to change just the guts of these things and make them a bit better. This place is not gonna be torn down and you know, build up in a lead platinum necessarily. It'd be too expensive. But can you do this in a financially um, beneficial way that actually hits those sustainability goals, the health goals, and the financial um, you know, opportunity that is there? And uh, you know, I, I just I wanted to tell that story just because back to that idea of it's not sustainable, it's better. That's kind of the point I'm trying to make. It's a great way of putting it. So you, you know, you say that uh, break core energy, you exist to make buildings perform better. Mm -hmm. What does that mean? Well, I, I think it comes back a little bit to, to what we just touched on. Um, you know, if you look at these LED lights, something as simple as that. <laughs> I, I had a small company that I started myself. I don't have a huge financial background, and a friend of mine said, "Look, I've got these two guys. They're doing something similar to you, but they're really good." Financially, they had worked. The, the two founders of my company had worked uh, on Wall Street for 15 years. They're structured finance guys, and under Lehman, before that had collapsed, which maybe isn't a good uh, advertisement, but uh, they had they had a lot of capital, a lot of uh, tax equity, and everything else. And they said, you know, get into solar, see what this is about. They got in. Lehman collapsed around, and they kept going. They sold about 300 million dollars worth of commercial industrial solar, and they realized 
you know, the technology is there, the engineers that can you know, identify and put these things in and construct these things are there, but the underwriting is not sophisticated and we can really help there. So they sold that off and started this company, Brightcore. I bought into about five years ago and been the president ever since. And the whole idea, you know, is really just to find the financial opportunities. And, and to be honest, when we started doing this, I, was, I met these guys who were quite bright, um, and I thought, that's so depressing. You know, you're just taking lighting out and, and you know, replacing with something that's slightly more efficient. But he said, no, that's the foot in the door. There's so much. We start to understand the en energy systems then. You know what the, um, the rate of you know, kilowatt per hour is. You, you understand what their entire draw is, what zone they're in if, if, you know, on their peak demands and what we can do with that with time of use pricing and everything else. It becomes pretty sophisticated and tough. And so when you talk about better, when you replace that bulb, I mean, we did a, a school district not far from where our office is nor, uh, north of the city. And it was uh, probably a million and a half dollar job. But this, you know, then you throw in the incentives and everything else, which is always wonderful, icing on the cake, but you can't quite chase that. You go where the money is for sure. But we can finance this, and we're saving about $200,000 a year for the school system who has not put a dime into this thing. And that's a very, you know, that's a good advertisement for us. It doesn't always work out like that. But if the incumbent technology is somewhat inefficient, I can come in there and really put something in that can be 30, 40, 60% more efficient. Yet you can dial in these things. When the kids in the lower grades have nap time, you can dial down the lights. When it's a, an emergency situation, you can turn them on. Um, you have smart technology that when in, it's the summertime, it goes on at certain intervals and not. These, these aren't particularly sophisticated, but you can do more with a simple LED light bulb than you can in an incandescent. And that's what I mean by better. There's more functionality, there's more um, tunability, you get the color temperature right, and I can't tell you how many people I run, ah, LEDs are ugly, I've, you know, I got the, well, it's like 5,000 Kelvin, and it's, it's kind of like the lights you're seeing now, it's not what you'd have in your home. When you start doing it properly, it is better. You know, that, th th those Teslas, you know, you, you used to think about an electric car. That's the equivalent of putting on that sweater and turning it out. You know, you're going slow, but you're not, using fuel. Well, now these things accelerate faster than Ferraris do. And I think you're going to see that more and more. Um, not unlike, you know, my friend Larry, who has that high-end house, um, all built on performance. And you'll have more comfort. You have a better work environment, a better living environment. And um, hopefully, and not always, but that's where we target, is that you'll get financial benefit from doing it. Now with this crowd being uh, all hotel design and construction people, yep. um, obviously in the hotel industry, you know, the idea of sustainability and you know, sure. energy savings and that sort of thing, net zero is becoming a, a big buzz um, conversation, but uh, how does this apply to them? How does this apply to hotel spaces? Yeah, I, I think in every way it applies to any place you're living and working. I think. The hotel space, from my understanding, I'd love to you know, learn more about it. And we've worked with the hotels before, something as simple as lighting your common areas, the safety outside and everything else. That's pretty straightforward. So, you know, low hanging fruit normally. The hard part is often they're franchised or independent and you don't know whether you're selling them. When we work with commercial industrial, it's pretty tough for me to knock on your door and say, I wanna put you know, a 20 year power purchase agreement on your roof. And you're like, look man, we may be flipping this thing in three years or 17 years, and I don't want to be encumbered, I get that. But end of useful life, um, you know, the reality is you guys are paying the bills. And where it gets really complicated is we work with a lot of uh, office buildings downtown, and you have a lease, and you have an owner, so I'm asking the owner to pay for something that the lessee is getting the benefit from. It's, it's just, it doesn't work. With hotels, it seems to me a little bit more straightforward. If you're paying the bills, anything, whether it's, you know, uh, I guess, yeah, you have the same picture that I'm looking at, <laughs> yeah. right? The parking lot, you can monetize that. Your roof space, tougher to do because you often have, um, you know, HVAC equipment up there. But increasingly, we're seeing even retrofits of geothermal. I don't mean the lava geothermal. I mean geothermal heat exchanges. And now it's opening up your roof space where we're doing one on Long Island right now that becomes a common area. Now you're monetizing your roof in a way because you're literally burying your, um, your HVAC system. So... It starts with an evaluation like anything else. Does one size fit all? Absolutely not. And I think particularly when it comes to the financing. Um, you may have 
you know, extra cash, use it. Um, we don't really make money as much on the financing. That's not what we do. That's to move projects along. When you're dealing with school systems, municipalities, and, and private companies too, you might say, yeah, I'd love to have LEDs across the board or solar, but I'm not gonna dip in my pocket for a million dollars on something that's still working, understand. But if I can give you a, an equation that says, you know, I can put this thing in and you'll be saving 50 grand a year, then you start to think about it for a school system that's meaningful. Um, and also I think, you know, I've dealt a lot with the NHLs, doing a lot with NHL Green and a lot of the sports leagues. You're such a uh, public facing entity and this buzzword of sustainability and everything else, even if we're not even sure what it means, you don't want to be a laggard. You don't have to go out in front and make this thing crazy and lose your shorts over it. But at the same time, if your competition's saying, you know, I got this green hotel and you're not doing a thing, I'm not, you know, I, I would expect that that's not a great position to be in marketing wise. But hotels, we always start with lighting. Um, and just then you're starting to understand the bill, your energy use and where the, you know, the low hanging fruit is and, you know, if there's not opportunity there financially for you, there usually isn't for us. So I feel pretty good about aligning because often we'll own these things. We'll do geothermal as a service. We'll do lighting as a service where we literally own the lights and you guys are leasing them from us. You get the light. <clears throat> we get the um, you know part of the savings and so do you. So there's pretty creative ways of doing this. The fundamental numbers either work or they don't. And that's when we have boots on the ground. We come in and say, gee, you have, you know, metal halide lights here, we can take these things out and put in something that works better. So this is a, true across the board. I mean, we've, we've looked at these things, uh, you know, where I used to play it at Madison Square Garden, they had a really an, an aesthetic uh, interest in us coming in and, and putting in some locker room lights, different for the Knicks, different for the Rangers, different for the coaching staff. It was all had to be very controllable and everything else. And they, you know, they've got great electricians there, and, but, but they couldn't quite get the color temperatures right. So we came in and did it. It was a small deal, but it looks good on the website. We did it. And um, my engineer was leaving and we we're in the, the delivery bay underneath Madison Square Garden. That's open 24 seven, trash coming in, teams coming in, out, everything. And uh, he looks up and these metal halides are there and there's about 30 of them. He's like, do you mind if I just count these things and take a look guys? Like, yeah, go ahead. This is a $30,000 job that would pay back in eight months. And they're like, well, we gotta go in front of the board and it's MSG, we don't need it. Well, you know, two years later, I get a call back. I mean, I've taken them off my list. Uh, you know, people didn't wanna do it. They're like, yeah, we're ready to do that project. I'm like, I'm sorry, what, what project are we referring to? Because we had done some other ones alone there. He said, you know, the, the um, delivery bay. And it was so much inertia. And I do understand it, I got my own home. I mean, it's, it, we're all going about doing our own things, but that's where we try to be just kind of one throat to choke, come in, we'll do the evaluation, we'll give you some kind of um, indicative proposal and say, here's you know, orders of magnitude what you're gonna save or what this thing's going to cost. And so you can dimension it pretty quickly and, and get in and get out. And I'm just shocked because we all go about our things and years go by without doing it. We all just came out of COVID. We had loads of people that had, you know, lined up to do these things and then they kind of pull back. We're not even allowed on campus, particularly when it comes to schools, but it's happening more and more now. And I think the financial benefits are starting to become, people are orienting themselves in that regard. It's not sustainable. This is just efficiency. You know, Goldman Sachs doesn't put up with much efficiency across their entire, <laughs> what, 60,000 uh, employees, their, their hierarchy. They try to get their money's worth of everything. But it's amazing to me how easily we overlook just the built environment and just go, well, you know, this is what it is. Well, there's better out there, and that's what we're trying to put in. Excellent. In the last 20 seconds, what would be the Stanley Cup equivalent in your current <laughs> position? He is a Stanley Cup winner, by the way, 1994. I think um, from, from, from where we are, we have to do a better job of working with utilities, right? You know, whenever you're selling a product, you're a hammer and you're looking for a nail, and we have to come to the stakeholders. For you guys, it's hotels. For the um, utilities, it's what is gonna help them and not hurt them and really make it a win-win-win. And I think that's where we have to do a better job. The technology's out there. It's just how does it apply and what's the financing to get it right to improve your building. If it doesn't improve your building and doesn't save you cash, you shouldn't be talking to me. But I think that's just something I'd like to see more and more people explore. And you know, until we run out of buildings that need to be retrofitted, I mean, that would be the Sandy Cup right there. Then we'll start worrying about the next technology, but we've got too much stuff on the shelf right now that's not being deployed. 
Excellent. Thank you so much, Mike. For having it was a me. pleasure yeah. Thanks, having guys. you up here. Thank you.